She's in charge. Okay, so um, this is about predictive lead and account scoring. We're all about a predictive analytics here. Um, I think I introduced myself to everyone in the room beforehand, but just in case it's not clear, I'm Tom Haymore. I work a lot with our data science team and also our product team and doing a combination of marketing, trying to create, uh, generate demand for this, but also explain why it's important and also do a lot of kind of next generation research. So we have projects out in the works with our data scientists and everything from career planning um, to you know, uh, natural language processing. And we'll be talking about um, artificial insemination of cattle in a moment as well. Not our project, not our project, but a predictive analytics project. Um, so let's see. So uh, many of you are probably familiar with this quote. Um, and um, I think it uh, applies to pretty much anything we do in sales. In sales, typically, right, it's been in our reps we trust, or, you know, or, in, or in the quarterly roll-up or in the quarterly close we trust. But what we're trying to say is basically we trust data. And the nice thing about this philosophy is that it can hurt feelings when you tell people that you'd like to submit them or have them submit to new processes and new ways of doing things, but you just tell them flat out, it's all about the data. Before we talk about our projects and our products and our predictive stuff, I want to talk about data generally. Is anyone familiar with what this graph shows? It's a famous graph. I believe it may have been by Edward Tuft, who is a famous visualization, uh, visualization expert. Anyone know, anyone familiar with this chart and what it's showing? Correct. Yes, this is one of the best visualizations. I want to say I should say in history of visualization, but I'm not really sure like how far back that goes. There's some really you know killer stuff back in like the Stone Age, right? Um, so this is the size of Napoleon's. I can't speak French. I'll just say in uh, English, Grand Army, which if you guys know even a little bit about history, it was the biggest, most professional fighting force that at least the Western world had seen, perhaps ever, at least since Roman times. And he, what was the fateful decision he made? If you're familiar with the movie, he tried to start a land war in Asia. He wanted to attack Moscow. So the light beige or whatever is the size of his army going there. The black is the size of his army going back. So this is awesome. This is very cool. More effective than any numbers could. I think it, it, it portrays the kind of the extent of the failure he experienced. Is this predictive? No. It's historical data, right? Now, could other people have predicted for him that this would happen? Yes, but Napoleon never submitted that sort of, those sort of constraints. OK, anyone familiar with Pew Research Center? No one? Am I the only one? Yes, thank you. I see some nods. I like encouraging nods, but I like hands because I can see you nod, but everyone else sees your hands and they know I'm not completely insane. So the Pew, Pew does a lot, of different uh, a lot of different polls. And right now, mostly what they do is talking about Trump and Clinton. But I didn't want to get political. I didn't want to step on anyone's toes. I'm not judging. I am judging, but I'm not going to tell you I'm judging, whatever your political leanings are. So I tried, what I tried to find was polls on millennials because we all agree, apparently now, that we hate millennials, even though many of us are millennials. I am not. Kristen is. Um, so, but I couldn't find, the sad thing is there were great polls on millennials, but they were all too long to fit on this slide. So I had to go with something else. So this is some data on how people engage with content and how people um, engage Facebook versus Twitter. Is this predictive data? No. No, you can do predictions from it, right? You can take trends, you can understand, oh, maybe I'm going to make a marketing campaign slightly differently or I'm going to create new content, but it's not predictive. That doesn't mean you can't make predictions with it, but it's not predictive. And our next, I told you, I was going to talk about a new topic that you did not come prepared for. Does anyone know what this is a chart of? It would be amazing if you did, but... Exactly. It's artificial insemination of cattle. That's amazing that you knew that. So here's what this chart is about. These are cows. Now, I come from Texas. I'm very familiar with cows. For those of you who aren't, these are cows. Now, 
again, you may not be familiar with cows, but they don't usually come with um, jewelry. Now, this, this wristband, it's not wrist, leg band, calf band, I don't, I don't know what they call it. I don't know what the cows call it. But this piece of jewelry the cows have is a pedometer. It has a five-year battery life, and it can withstand pretty much any of the weather that the cows would find themselves in. Now, the reason they have this uh, pedometer is because the green line is the movement patterns of a cow who's not in heat. The orange line is the movement pattern of a cow who is in heat. This is important because, and I apologize for going into these details, I'm not an expert, I did watch this on YouTube, is the cow's movement patterns change dramatically when they go into heat. It's a very short window of time that the cow can conceive, and it only happens every couple of weeks. And so the, the profitability of a farm or a ranch can be drastically impacted on whether or not you're capturing that cow right at the moment that they're ready to conceive. You see optimum time, and you see female or male. Now, this is a little bit of the impact. This is a, a pilot program in India, so those prices are not in uh, US dollars. But you can see the overall percentage impact that this had on the profitability of the farms. Now, this data could be just descriptive. You could say with this data, yes, the orange line is what cows look like when they're in heat, and the green line is what normal cows look like. But they made it predictive because they tied it together with a use case and then acted on it. They were able to predict when the cows would conceive and what they would conceive. So is anyone familiar with this picture to bring it back to sales? And it's sad that not even my own colleagues are raising their hand. But anyone familiar? Yes, Tori, thank you so much. This is NeuralView, which we're going to get into in a minute. This is also predictive, and I'll explain why in a few minutes. But this is the NeuralView product. We'll also talk about Sales Advisor. So NeuralView predicts, much like the cows, when, when your prospects, um, leads, or opportunities are displaying a pattern of behavior that indicates not that they're likely to conceive, but they're likely to buy, or at the very least, likely to pick up the phone. So how do you make predictive data work? So we saw the graph of Napoleon. Anyone who's watched uh, The Princess Bride or has a rough understanding of history should have been able to predict that outcome from Napoleon. We saw the Pew Research polls. You, should, you could see trend lines for millennials on their attitude toward um, government and established forms of government and predict Bernie Sanders' rise to some degree, but that isn't predictive data. And part of the reason why is that the way we say and that we use predictive data means more than just data. We tend to say things like predictive analytics. I don't know if any of you remember your college stats course, but a simple logistic regression will give you a predicted coefficient. Voila, one line of code in almost a limitless number of applications will give you a predictive analytical model. But when we say predictive analytics, that's not what we mean. We don't mean, hey, we're going to put a little lipstick on a logistic regression, and we're going to send it out into the market, and everyone's going to be happy. This is what we're talking about. The reason, the reason that the farmers and the, the farms can make use of the cows, of the pedometer on the cows, is because they have the data, they have predictive science, that is uniquely tailored to those circumstances. There is not really a black box of predictive science. Machine learning is not something you can just toss infinite variety of data points into and get wisdom out of. It is very, very powerful, but it's not quite that powerful. And you have prescriptive applications. So that final, that final, the final leg there on this stool we'll talk about a little bit more, but they were able to turn it into action and not just have what a typical BI team would deliver which is a spreadsheet, uh, often a CSV file with insights that you might be able to act on in the future. What does this mean for inside sales? So we do have a lot of predictive analytics. And I've listed several here. And we have a predictive engine called Neuralytics, and that's its fancy simple symbol there in the middle. It does do a lot of black box work. There's a lot of machine learning going on, and it can, it can analyze a huge array of situations. 
But its real value isn't taking like the undifferentiated mass of your Salesforce data or your CRM data and then just spitting out wild correlations. Because guess what? There will be really, really strong correlations between data that you do not need help correlating. You do not need help correlating that there is a high, high risk or high probability that someone who is rated as commit or high likelihood by a human is also likely to close. You do not need machine learning to tell you that if a deal has not been touched in six months, it's likely not to close. And machine learning could tell you that, but like it's, you're not doing yourself a whole lot of favors there, right? So we have lead account and opportunity scoring. These are specific algorithms that are very finely tuned, and that's the science. They still need the data. So again, back to this whole logistic regression where I talked about how a lot of people could, you know, could kind of spin up a predictive science model pretty easily. You also need really good data. The good news is that this is a win-win situation. So you are quite possibly the best source of the data you need. And you don't believe it. There's always this wish that there's like this silver bullet of data. Like if we just, if we just get demand base, you know, or if we just get database USA, or, or if LinkedIn would just allow really anyone to use their API, we would get the data we need to close deals. But for the most part, the data you need is the data you have, combined with other really important data. So with Neuralytics, the reason the data works is because we take anonymized and aggregate data from many different customers and use it to find patterns, and then we can improve the algorithms to apply it to your data. And then finally, we have our sales acceleration platform. So if you don't have the prescriptive application on the bottom right, your predictive insights go where all predictive insights usually end up, which is where the BI team sends it to the head of marketing. And the BI team might say something like, it looks like the customer segment that comes from Michigan and is shopping for parkas and the weekends is 12% more likely to convert. And the VP of marketing says, great. And he hands it to someone like Brad and says, hey, create a demand gen campaign for Michiganders or whatever they call themselves who are shopping for parkas, right? That is, that's useful. That's not bad. That's better than it used to be, which is you just hire someone who's done it before and you hope they know what they're doing. But prescriptive applications take the predictive science, they take the data it's built on, and they deliver the next best action. So if we think about the cows, and some of those of you came in late, quick background. Uh, we might be able to address it in the Q&A. Some of the predictive science that uh, this is actually Fujitsu and others are working on is about the artificial insemination of cows, which is more exciting to some of us than others. But the reason it works for them is because they have specific algorithms on how to detect when a cow is in heat and specific diseases, and also when the cow has escaped the farm. But I think that's a little less interesting for our use case. They have the data on the steps the cow, the things the cow is doing. It's a pedometer. They measure the cow's activity. And finally, they have a monitoring and communication platform so that instead of having a team of people available every night, all night long, for when the cows hit the optimal moment for insemination, they can just get alerted and they jump on it. And they can build their plans around. They can build a prescriptive application that says, I need to increase my output, say, of milk. And then they can say, OK, I need to have this many cows give birth to so many other cows, and so on and so forth. In sales, well, depending on your industry, there might be some ag tech here. I don't want to don't wanna criticize. But for the most part, I don't think you guys are selling cow or agricultural products or beef or whatever. But the sales acceleration platform tells you, tells the reps, OK, the next best action is what? And we'll get into a little bit more about how this differs from, say, the human judgment and the machine judgment. OK, what is the problem we're trying to solve? Who here uses some form of lead scoring or opportunity scoring? Nice. Um, who here uses R? Is it everyone uses R's, lead or opportunity scoring? You don't have to say yes. Who else do you use if not us? I saw some hands over here. Part out. OK, yeah, totally. Mar very well established marketing lead scoring um, player. Anyone else? Am I using Marketo or any of those? Marketo. We actually use Marketo as well. And so the nice thing about market, uh, marketing lead scoring and sales lead scoring is they actually can coexist very well. Um, so how, how, did, how do these scores typically built? Some of you might have very fine, highly tuned uh, ways of building it. I'd love to hear about that too. 
But how do you usually build the scoring system for something like Marketo lead scoring? Whoa, sorry. Can I, I'm sorry. I hate to feel like we're in school, but like I'm just not. I'm not smart enough. Can I see a hand? I saw you. Sorry, you're just closer to me, so I saw you. Yeah. So the source is big, and how much information you can pull out of them. Like if it's a web form, and who decides or what decides what the different weights are. So source versus demographic versus uh, what the offer is, timing. <laughs> What's a camel? Horse built by a committee, yeah. Um, yeah, so it's human-based, right? Which, again, let's, let's, I don't want to criticize it because we use it too. And it's a huge improvement over, you know, Google Analytics said we had this many people come and, we have a, and we're getting an email every time someone fills out a form and I'm forwarding that to some poor marketing intern who's like manually typing it into a system. But the downside of human-based scoring is that it is human-based scoring. And it isn't able to find the correlations and the combinations of correlations that the machine learning can. So the, the end result is that even if you have a real, you feel like really confident in your human-based uh, marketing lead scoring, you still have a vast majority of your leads that are never going to close. And the problem with that is if you have, let's say, a score for lead quality on the bottom, 0 to 100. And you have the number of leads in black here. Let's say this is a pretty high volume sales team. Let's say overall they're going to have tens of thousands of leads. And in each of these buckets they're going to have, say, 2,000 leads. If you don't know how to differentiate them, you're going to get a random application of effort to leads. That's what those green bars are. So you'll have sales reps spending the same amount of time on leads that are ranked 0 to 10 which literally will be leads from your own employees who are testing out the web forms and happen to use their personal email address and not the work email address. There'll be people who you may have bought from before. There'll be people from IP addresses that you shouldn't trust. You'll be able to filter out some of that with um, human-based rules, but it will only ever be as good as like the latest committee decision or latest, you know, the VP of marketing usually who puts it together. So you'll get very inconsistent results because you won't know the leads you're working. And then some poor sales rep or sales development rep is always getting stuck with the 0 to 20 leads, and he ends up having to move on. He's depressed and doesn't know if he's a good salesperson or not. Anyway, so the nice thing is that the highest quality leads close at vastly higher rates than the lowest quality leads. Well, and as a side note, we'll talk about opportunities also in a minute. And this is a little bit more focused on the leads, but we'll get to opportunities. You can focus exclusively on your higher rated leads, ignore the lower rated leads, and still have the same results. Now you have a couple of ways, there's a couple ways to go to take advantage of this. One is to downsize your sales team, which no sales org ever likes to do, right? You can't, you can't win by going in there and be like, I have the perfect solution for you to not just use machines all the time. And sales orgs are just like, no, 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 that's not going to work. But the other is that it's, it's as simple as which leads do you do first? Because these bottom leads are never going to drive any, any, any revenue of note. So say that green dotted line is the close rate. All of your revenue, all of your, all of your movement is going to come from the highest rated leads. So when you think lead scoring, I don't want you to think lead scoring. Lead scoring is the vehicle. Right? Lead scoring is the, the way we get you to where we want you to go. What it actually delivers is prioritization. It's what you should be working on now. That's what it really is all about. And it's, it should be delivered in a way that lets you actually act on that prioritization. So this is NeuralView. And I'll talk a little bit in detail now about the two different scores we have. So we have neural score and contactability. So, <clears throat> and you see, the, you see the history there of the scores on the right. And this is in the Dynamics platform, but it's uh, virtually the same in the Salesforce platform or if you're using it on our, one of our independent uh, systems. So why do we have two separate scores? Not an inside salesperson. <laughs> yeah, I know. I'll have a question for you later, uh, but a smarter one. Why do you think we have two scores? It's like written right up there if you have good eyesight. Yeah, but like yeah. So if we have all this fancy science about who's going to buy, why do we also need a contactability score? You need to get a hold of them. It sounds really dumb. It's like we have this like space age pr predictive technology. We can predict everything. 
but we still, so many of the solutions don't predict when the person will answer the phone. And so, um, how many of you do have uh, SDR teams? Are we all generous? So, you, you, know, you know what it looks like. It's a floor, it's a floor usually, um, clustered together, often very young sales reps. And it sounds, really, it sounds stupid, but those of you who manage these teams understand, trying to get um, SDRs, or sales development reps, to even call in the right time zone is a huge hassle. You have an East Coast team, and you have that poor person who's assigned to the West Coast. He can't go to lunch with his rep, you know, he can't go to lunch with his colleagues. He's always calling at 8 a.m. in California and then different times, and it's always out of sync, and it's very confusing. And it sounds really dumb, but it's actually really hard to take a CRM like Salesforce and somehow like pull out a part of it for the, for the rep who is assigned to a different time zone. Right? And the contact ability score helps with that because the contact ability score and other, other business rules we have attest. Another one which sounds fairly basic but is actually hard to implement is uh, weather. You know, if it's, if it's raining in LA, everyone is terrified and they're inside, you can't go home. You know, if it's sunny in Seattle, you should try selling to the next year. Because everyone is just like, I visit Seattle when it's sunny and it seems, it's like, it's magic. Everyone's outside, they're polite, no one wants to buy anything, unless it's like pizza or brownies or whatever they eat there. Um, Anyway, so, um, so those, those, rules, those rules need to be inserted automatically. Back to predictive, the three legs of our predictive pyramid or triforce for you uh, uh, Zelda fans. Um, so the predictive application needs to deliver to the rep not, not a note or an insight that says, hey, this person's in the Eastern time zone. That means they might not be at work right now. And the rep has to read that and then think, wait, it's like 30 p.m. The rep just needs to either see or not see that lead, especially with the high volume dialing team. They need to see only leads that are actually likely to pick up the phone and likely to close. And the reason back to adding two scores is back to my point about predictive science. You can, anybody with um, uh, using the open source stats software R or any of the one programming languages that quite do it online, Google Play has a free service to do this. Um, you could throw it all, all your, all your, all your columns in your CRM into a database, and you could pull out the correlation. But that's not the point. You don't want a CSV file. We're trying to get beyond BI um, to the point of predictive applications. And then I'm supposed to show you more, more screenshots of neural view. Yeah. So when you're first getting started, yeah. you have all this data in the CRM. How are you coming up with the initial score? That Perfect you question. Have? We have what's called a general model. So that goes back to us. We have this corpus of 90 billion data points. That's from a combination of us and other customers. It's all anonymized, um, but it, we do get to see the pattern. So typically, customers will see a double-digit increase in, say, contact rates or close rates, just depending on how they how structure their team. Just from doing that general model. 
But then when they go to what we call a custom model, they'll see like a twice again as many benefits. And again, depending on the team, uh, depending on how they structure this, it's a very specialized SDR team, then they might look more at uh, talk time and contact rates. Because again, like, you know, what, what are you trying to get on scoring? You don't want to see a, a stat that says, hey, reps are spending more of their time on high value lead, uh, high, highly scored leads. You're like, well, good, but what you want to see is higher contact rates, more talk time, more deal flow. And so those are the KPIs you'll typically see. And with an SDR team, it's going to be using talk time and contact rates. And so you have the general model, and you move to the custom model. But then, you get back to this problem of prioritization, you get set up by producing lists, dialing lists. If you're governing, if you're running a, a SDR team, you want to build a list. So what you'll do is you'll build a list that has your own business rules. And it's, you want, you need that human input if for no other reason than you have teams who maybe dial by territory or maybe they dial by market segment. You have to be able to sort these. And then you can set other rules like say, um, you know, what times, you know, during the day to call. But then you add in the neural scores as a filter to your list. So for instance, we had one client who got the most use out of it by saying, okay, the hottest hours during the day, say from 8 to 11 in there, in the local time zone, we're only going to call leads that have a neural score of 85 or above. The absolute best leads, they never wanted to call them during the dead hours in the middle of the day. Because then those leads get burnt up, and they're not able to get a hold of them, and they lose their value. But, conversely, from 11 to 3, before the next uh, high value hour, all the other leads would be in the bucket. And the, the reps would be assigned to clerical work and dialing. But they, there was low risk dialing. They knew that the people they were calling are probably low, low likelihood to convert. But then it's also OK if you're missing them during the lunch break. You're not losing. You're not leaving as much of value on the table. And then the contact ability comes in again with, uh, if you're dealing with the dialing list, then um, you'll see the, the reps, the leads first that are most likely to contact. And we just want the rest to not see the leads are not going to answer their phone. That's part of wrapping predictive into a predictive application, not just uh, kind of stale statistics. So does anyone, um, so some of you manage SDR teams. So I'm assuming the others here are either just very interested citizens of Park City, or <laughs> you manage uh, maybe relationship sellers, account executives, closers. Um, let's see some nods. So I can't show you screenshots. My computer's working just fine. Um, oh, I'm sorry. So the huge projector that is directly in front of me uh, is not working anymore. Uh, so I can't show you, but I can show you after doing the Q&A. So Sales Advisor is a slightly different product. Um, I know with our naming, we should call Sales Advisor. So Sales Advisor is something different. It scores opportunities. Now, if you think about the way a specialized team would work for a general team, you go from leads to opportunities. Opportunities are where the money is coming from. For many of you, many of you, uh, your companies might have sales cycles that are longer than a day or a week. I know some, uh, like fleet for your sales cycles might be a little bit shorter. Uh, quick close rates, even though you have a lot of uh, account management that comes after that. Um, so if your account, if your if your close cycle is going to be 40, 60, 70 days, how do you prioritize the opportunity? What do you guys use now? Besides like the, the gut feeling of the experience. Any, any methods? No methods at all? How do you how do you get your teams to prioritize the opportunities you're working on right now? Yes. Value size. Value size. Oh, Value. Nice. this is a great one. So size of the deal? Size of the deal or Perfect. future future sales uh, yeah. or the ability to Entangled them with other services or products. I love two things about that answer. One is like the most sales answer ever. How do you prioritize? Size of the deal. I don't care if it's Antarctica. You know, I want to see the number of zeros there. That's how I prioritize. And the other one's entangle, which I feel like is like I love that. It's like cross sell, upsell, entangle them in the rest of your platform. That's that's what we're trying to do with you guys right now, right? Um, so size of the deal is a great one. Very solid. Even when we use our predictive science um, magic on it. The size of the deal will still be a very heavy weight, even in a even in a predicted algorithm. What else? What other factors do you look at? Whether or not we have competition. Oh. And if we're talking to the right people. That's great. And we're in the competition. Is that stored in the CRM? Yes. Perfect. That's actually great practice. If it's not in the CRM, it could very
very, very hard to standardize and to use any sort of algorithm on. And the right context was like a level. Yeah. So like executive. Perfect. That was all great to do. Anyone else? Oh, sorry. You, you first, then you. Spiffs. Oh, yeah. I like that too. I, you know, I'm in marketing, uh, sort of product marketing. I like to think, you know, we're like the slightly more reasonable side of marketing. You know, so I like Spiffs because I like to think it like integrates marketing campaigns. All imagine a world where Spiffs marketing campaigns and what the sales team is focused on are all aligned. Wouldn't that be crazy? But that is crazy. We're not going to do. No one does that. We're not going to do that. Okay. What was your? Size of the deal, level of the contact, and other things really fast to the type of data that only you and companies or industry have. The great thing about that is, as long as you're storing it, predictive algorithms can work on it. Because one of the great things about predictive algorithms is they're like children. They don't have biases, they don't care. They children don't care if it's not socially acceptable to take up their shirt in a restaurant. If it feels good, they're going to do it, right? As adults, we have more biases, thankfully, or you know, social, I don't know, emotional quotient, I don't know what you call it. But thankfully, we have understandings of what's acceptable and what's not. But predictive algorithms are like very, very smart, they're socially awkward children. They don't care if the CEO's favorite marketing campaign has the worst close rate. It will surface that and make it very, very painfully apparent that that marketing campaign is garbage. You know, they also don't care if they identify that a particular VP's team has the worst close rate. They will also surface that if it's in the CRM. And that's great because you need that, especially in a sales organization which is historically been driven by a, by a relationship model, people who are not working in the same building together, having to trust kind of the, the gut feeling and the intuition of so many people. Pulling out that data is huge in breaking down walls. So sales advisor, and I, again, I'll show you screenshots of my laptop if you want to come on up in our booth in the main hall, assuming it's not having you know, similar issues. Um, so sell, the sales advisor does something slightly different. It delivers two scores, again, but not contact ability. You can still get contact ability from your own deal. Sales advisor delivers one score that says, is this deal likely to close? And it doesn't give you a number. It gives you uh, kind of like a Likert scale, a five-point scale from very unlikely to very likely. And it gives a separate score that says, is the deal likely to close in this quarter? So let's take a stab. Why do you think we have number scores for leads and then qualitative scores for opportunities? This is probably a good answer here, but anyone? So we're talking about the predictive, the predictive and prescriptive applications. The point is not to give useless insights to your reps. To not give them like a little marketing white paper that says, oh hey, people from Indiana are really interested in mortgages. You know, this month. Like great, but then the reps have to do all this tying themselves in knots to try to figure out how to get there. Reps are cheating over from their territory into Indiana. That doesn't help you. What helps you is to just give the reps, present them with the leads that will close. Opportunities, there tend to be Again, depending on your business model, but they tend to be less in, they tend to be less volume and more they have longer sell cycles. And so reps need a different score. Giving an opportunity a score of 77 to a human being is like the first question is like is this percent? Is 77 out of 100? It doesn't give them a whole lot of feedback. If instead you give them immediately that this is very likely to close in this quarter, the rep instantly knows what to do, which is that opportunity goes to the top of their pile. Now the likelihood to close in this quarter is interesting. Back to one of the one of the stool, one of the legs of this stool, which is predictive science. Understanding which deals are going to close, which are going to close in this quarter, those are two different um, analytical questions, and you need both. Because if you know that a deal is very likely to close, but very unlikely to close in this quarter, what do you do as a rep? What do you tell a rep if you're the manager? Push it. Push it. Push it. 
And if the rep at the end of the week says, oh man, like I just know, I just know Google's gonna buy. I just know they're gonna buy. And the rep manager looks at it and says, yeah, likely to close, very unlikely to close in this quarter. And the rep spent all week on it. What's your advice to them? Allocate your time. Keep on that deal, push it, send them an email, move on. So again, the feedback is tightly tied to the rep's needs. The question on that as well as the other thing, so so the probability, I'm, I'm trying to, maybe I'm putting too much emphasis in the black box, but how can you do that when the buying cycle of different companies or enterprise may not be that quarter? Do you have some data that supports that this is the, the, the quarter that they buy this type of technology or data or service? And the second follow-up question would be, um, typical with, with these type of sales, you are selling to, by committee yeah. to, uh, to stakeholders that each one of them has their own timetable to, <coughs> to, to tie it off. So ha and maybe, your tech, maybe your algorithms figure that out, but uh, a small army of how can you predict that without an interview with the So it's a great prospect. question. I think, I think the gist of the question is the allocation of labor between human and machine judgment. And um, to answer the, the kind of machine judgment, machine learning, what it's capable of first, is the night, again, back to my point, machine learning doesn't, isn't biased. So it takes the data you have and that we have, or what other data providers you have, and it makes a judgment call. So to answer the question is that the data that will be in the CRM and in the predictive, uh, in the predictive model is a proxy for all of those things you just said. And the reason we use machine learning methods is because instead of, we're looking for interaction effects between all those data points. It is not in any way a perfect representation of the actual state of the deal. But what the what neuralytics or the predictive engines will find are the patterns that are indicative. So if, for instance, certain industries might buy in certain quarters only, or a deal size might be longer or shorter for certain industries. Neuralytics finds those interactions, and it will not understand for instance, that a CIO might have a different uh, length of time or review cycle, but it will understand that deals with CIOs in them, in the CRM, behave differently than deals without them. And it'll still be able to approximate the likelihood of close. Does so predict the ability, uh, once you've reached all of those folks, yeah. oh, by the way, you need to now go to procurement. Right. And it's start the process over. Right, back to human decision. So again, the nice thing about neurolytics is it actually, it, does, it doesn't care, right? Now, you might, have a, you might have a process in your sales team that has very explicit sort of fields for it went to procurement. You may not. You may just have, eh, it's likely to close, it's not like commit, you know, whatever it is. But neurolytics will simply find the patterns. And if you're a company of any size, then those patterns will be there. And it'll find the interactions between all those little data points and make a prediction. And it will never be 100% accurate, just like human judgment never will be. The nice thing about the human judgment is that you can take, there will be deals that are one-off. There will always be deals that fall outside the pattern, right? And that's why sales advisors and NeuralView don't remove leads from the database, right? NeuralView doesn't go in and say, we're going to delete 80% of your leads because they're garbage. What it does, we're going to score those poorly, give the sales managers tools to exclude those from lists. So sales advisor, isn't going to always say, hey, this is very likely to close and very likely this quarter, so you're only going to see it. Sales managers can still go in there and offer their own insights and say, look, I know what the algorithm's saying, but I know the deal. I know it's going to go to procurement. I know it's going to be six months out at least. And they can have that judgment in. And that part of that part of this discussion is with another tool called HP Forecast, which works really, really well if you're concerned and actually incorporates exactly what you're talking about. I don't want to get too into the details, but with HD Forecast, you can literally go in and say, my call on this or my judgment is X, Y, Z. And HD Forecast can say, well, I know just, I can take human judgment and machine judgment and combine them together. Um, but and let's talk more afterward as well. Because what you're getting at is really the gist of how you implement and use these systems correctly for your company. I see a hand over here. Yeah, so I was just, um, we're using the HD9 or HD Forecast. Yes. Um, is this product different? Because it sounds like a system. It's, inter it's very interwoven. So Sales Advisor exists both with and without HD Forecast. So HD Forecast 
we tend to pitch more strongly toward really uh, well, just bigger companies because it, a lot of it is focused on automating and predicting and saving time during forecasting. Sales Advisor is a component of that. Sales Advisor can be used much more properly by smaller companies who may not have uh, the need of a, a, you know, a comprehensive forecasting platform but need opportunity scoring. So HD Forecast will suck up, it, suck up the scoring as part of its forecasting. So it'll build its forecasting on what the scores of all the opportunities. It'll know this opportunity is at risk, this one's in the bag. So they're connected, but you can use Sales Advisor uh, without HD Forecast. Okay, yeah, I think we're, we're over here, and I apologize again for whatever this was. Um, and, but please, I have a couple minutes more for questions, but please feel free to uh, head off uh, to other sessions. Thank you very much for coming. Next question.